Uwu Lend was hacked for almost $20 million a couple days ago. And it was a pretty typical price oracle manipulation hack with some added oddities. What makes this so frustrating, and the reason why I'm making a video on this, is at the start of 2023, price oracle manipulation was the number one attack vector, with later on it kind of becoming the number three. And Peter, who runs the Block Threat Intelligence newsletter, recently put out a post being like, hey, I'm so excited. Reentrancies are no longer in the top 10. Price oracle and reward manipulation doesn't cause many losses. We are making progress as an industry. And the reason he's excited that these aren't in the top 10 is because these are, I don't wanna say easily avoidable, but they're one of the easier attack vectors to avoid. So the reason I wanted to make this video was to show you what happened and show you how these people who spot these hacks understand how to spot them and then tell you exactly what happened, how this happened, and importantly, what can we learn from this? Because what can we learn from this hack so that we as a security industry can be better? And this is why you should look at hacks and you should look at stuff like Solid It so you can learn, okay, what are hacks happening? What are people reporting so that we as an industry can get better at understanding these attacks? And the really frustrating thing about this is that we as an industry, I don't think actually learn that much. And that really sucks to say. So at the end of this video, I'm gonna have both tips for you as developers and security researchers to make sure your protocols are better, but also, surprisingly enough, some tips for investors looking to degen into some of these protocols. Not financial advice, but like, a little bit of like degen investor advice. So let's jump in. But I do want to make a disclaimer, of course. Hindsight is always 2020. We don't know the processes necessarily that led up to this, so we shouldn't be shaming these protocols. But we always want to say, what can we learn from this? Now, like I said, Uwu Lend was hacked for $20 million. And the root cause of this was, as we were saying, an Oracle manipulation attack. And I'll show you what it actually looked like and how kind of egregious this attack was in a minute. What I thought was really cool was one of the students who recently took the Cypher and Updraft security auditing course said, hey, uh, looking at the exploit, it looks like Ululend just got Thunder Loaned. And in the Cypher and Updraft curriculum, we have a course called Thunder Loan, which teaches basically exactly what happened here. So if you want to learn about these vulnerabilities and protect yourself against them, go through Cypher and Updraft because we literally teach you about this. And like in these videos, when I tell you, hey, if you learn this, you're going to be better than 80% of the current developers out there, I'm not kidding. So any Oracle manipulation basically can be boiled down to this. A user buys or sells a ton of some token to moon or plummet the price and then figures out a protocol that is incorrectly using that price and does something malicious based off of that. Now, usually these Oracle manipulations happen via flash loans, where it's the exact same process, except with the added step that a user will borrow a ton of a token, use that borrow to buy or sell a ton of of that token to moon or plummet the price, find the protocol that uses the price of the token from an exchange, destroys it, and then repays the loan. And looking into the Uwu Lend attack, that was more or less what happened here. Nick's tweet was one of the first ones I saw on this, basically said, hey, root cause is price manipulation, and he ended up posting some screenshots of the price being manipulated, and I'll show you how he got these in just a minute. But the token that was being manipulated was SUSDE. The borrowing price was 99 cents and the liquidating price was a dollar and three cents. So let's dig into how that actually happened by looking at one of the attack transactions. I'm here on openchain.xyz. This is a transaction visualizer. So the reason I wanted to go down this path and go on this rant here was, okay, well, what can we learn from this? Well, the two things that we can learn from this for sure, uh, and this is why I'm upset that I don't think we actually learned too much because we already know this, is number one, if you use a liquidity pool as a price oracle, you will get wrecked. Now, I've heard every rebuttal in the book to this, and I will get to that in a second. But the other thing that we want to learn from this is that every single piece of code that goes on chain, if you want that piece of code to be worth anything, you need to undergo an audit. So a lot of people have been pointing to this Peck Shield audit that happened almost a year and a half ago, this specific code base was not in scope of this audit. For me, it's a little bit hard to even read the audit report and even know what was in scope. But at least that contract that I just showed you guys, which had the root cause, was not in scope. Uh, so I went through this code base and I said, ah, this is rough. This is not good. They're using liquidity pools as an oracle. That's how they easily got wrecked there. They're using exponential moving average for some reason, which, which is also not great as an oracle anyways for a ton of reasons. and. Curve even talks about, hey, like maybe like don't use that as your Oracle. That's probably not a good idea. 
So I said, okay, well, let me look deeper into this code base. Let's see what broke down in the process. Maybe their tests didn't catch this. Maybe they didn't think about this. Let's go to their code base and actually see what happened here. And this is where things go, oh, okay, they made a pretty rough common mistake to, mm, okay, there was no way in hell this protocol wasn't gonna get hacked. I remember hindsight 2020, but let's take a look at this protocol's contracts repo. So this is the Uwu Lend, Uwu Contracts. And if you'll notice something in here, there's no readme, there's no tests. You click into any of these folders, uh, there's nothing. So you go, okay, okay, well, maybe it's in another folder. You go to their staking v2 UI and you get hit with, this is a sample hard hat contract or this is a sample hard hat project. You go to staking v3, you get the same thing. Okay, well, at least this has a test folder. Um, that's so maybe they at least tested their their v3 code base. But we look at the important piece, which is the contracts, and there's nothing in here. Additionally, what you won't find is that vulnerable contract that we just walked through that had the actual bug in it. So either they just deployed it directly to prod without doing any tests on it, or they did it behind closed doors. Now, I'll say that every single product I've ever worked with that says, hey, yeah, we did those tests behind closed doors. They either lied uh, and they didn't do shit or their tests are so bad and so worthless. That's the real reason they didn't push them up because they didn't want uh, people to see that they didn't really test anything and they didn't really care to test anything. So this is where this code base becomes a little bit more egregious to me because they said, hey, we forked Aave. Aave is battle tested code base. And we're basically using Aave, but we changed a bunch of stuff and then we didn't test our stuff and then we shipped it and then we did a whole bunch of stuff that Aave does not do. So look, there's 100% a chance that there are tests that happen on this code base behind closed doors. However, I doubt it. If you go to their documentation, they have this section called, is there any risk? And it says, hey, the potential risks are smart contract risks, a bug within the protocol code and liquidation risk. Every possible step has been taken to minimize the risk as much as possible. The protocol code has been forked from Aave V2's battle-tested open source code, and it has been audited. Any changes in code and or features are tested and audited before release. Uh, well, if that was the case, I don't see those. Additionally, there have been no exploits or security issues since launching in 2022, except for when they added new code that was not audited and probably unlikely tested. To me, this being your GitHub as a protocol is unacceptable. And I'm sorry I'm calling them out for this. This turned out to be a little bit angrier of a video than I wanted it to be, but this cannot and must not be what your project looks like. The dev learnings from this and security learnings from this, I think are pretty simple. It's a continuation of the exact same thing. Do not use liquidity pools as pricing oracles. Now. Let me get to the pushback that's going to happen because guess what? You as a developer or security researcher are going to be put in a place where you go, ah, I remember Patrick told me not to use liquidity pools as pricing oracles. However, the VC says to do it. We don't want to wait for a chain link price feed. We don't have money to pay for oracles. Let's get to all the pushbacks. So number one, we have tests. They are just not public and or proprietary. Like I said, everyone who's told me this is full of shit. If you have tests, just show them like I promise you you're not doing anything proprietary in your tests and this actually leads me to the first piece of alpha for investors out there if you see a code base that looks like this and has no tests has no readme they say hey I promise you we're good don't trust them because I highly doubt it the second piece of pushback hey there was no chain link price feed for the token that I want too bad don't use it you will get hacked but they say oh but my protocol relies on the price of my token so we're going to use the Uniswap pools or the curve pools to do this. Well, guess what? Your 50 million, 80 million, $100 million market cap token has no price. What do you mean, Patrick? You just said it's a $20 million market cap. What are you talking about? Clearly there's a market cap. FTX, okay? If a whale just holds 99.9% .9 of your token, holds it at like $20 million market cap or whatever, it's very easy for a whale to come in and manipulate it. You have no token price. 
Illiquid tokens don't have a real price. If you have a low market cap or it's hard to trade or it's a liquid, it doesn't really have a token price and your protocol shouldn't rely on it because of that. One of the things that I thought was really good in the Peck Shield audit report, even though it didn't even include the actual code that had the bug in scope, was the first finding report on this was potential protocol risk from low liquidity assets. The UWU protocol supported a few tokens like, uh, like these ones, and those ones are even easier to manipulate their price because of how illiquid they actually are. In any case, if you don't have a price feed and you skirt the rules to use the liquidity pool, this will happen to you and you will get wrecked. Another piece of pushback, hey, Chainlink node operators aren't going to make the price feed for us. Guess what? Getting Oracle data is expensive. They have to send a lot of transactions. They have to pay for a lot of data. So if you're not willing to sponsor the price feed, I don't know what to tell you. If anything, this is good for you because they're going to help prevent you from getting hacked. So if you don't want to pay for a price feed, in a sense, that's great because then you will prevent your users from getting rug pulled like this. And that's usually the biggest piece of pushback that I get is, hey, there is no price feed, so I have to do this. Well, I'm going to say, hey, there's probably a reason there's no price feed or you should ask for it and sponsor it. It's expensive. It's expensive to get this shit right. I don't know what to tell you. So I know I talked a lot and I know I was a little bit more angsty than I normally am. Just to reiterate, takeaways here, using liquidity pools as price oracles and you will get wrecked. If you want to learn more about how you will get wrecked, be sure to take the Cypher and Updraft security and auditing curriculum because we go over this very issue. Number two, every piece of code that goes on chain needs an audit if you want it to be worth anything. I launched this ZK Sync Syncs project. I don't really care if it's worth anything, so I didn't audit it. If you have a financial protocol where you're going to be handling a lot of users' money, yeah, you definitely want to get that audited. And then finally, a piece of advice for investors. If you see a code base without any tests, stay far away from it. <laughs>